Hello. It's midwinter and there's not much actively growing in the garden at this time of year, but there's still plenty to do in between resting and recuperating. I'm Liz Zorab and this is By the Farm. In this video, I'll be joined by some gardening friends. Hugh will be talking about garden planning. Uh, Niall will look at the structure uh, of the garden in the winter. Alexandra will show you some of her beautiful winter garden. Jane will be creating a display. JB will be sowing some seeds. And I'll be showing you how to care for autumn fruiting raspberries so that you get a really good harvest next year. But first, let's hear from Hugh Richards with some great tips for garden planning. January is the start of the new year and it's a perfect time to start dreaming about the upcoming growing season and to put together a little bit of a planting plan. There are so many styles of planting plans out there. You can do one big plan on a bit of paper or a monthly planting plan and a bit of a calendar. But regardless of what style of plan you're going to make, I think there's three really important things that every single gardener should consider before getting down and finalising the details. The first thing to do is to have a little review about the previous growing season. Now, if you've never grown before, what I want you to do is to make a list of the 10 most exciting edible crops that you absolutely want to grow and learn as much about them as possible. If you have had a previous season, then get a bit of paper, draw a line down the middle, and on one side, you wanna think about all of your favorite successes, all of the things to truly celebrate about the previous growing season. On the other side of the line, to write down the things that you found were perhaps the most challenging, areas where you thought could maybe be improved, potential failures of crops that you just don't understand why that happened. In winter, we have the luxury of time, so we can research and investigate as much as possible, and then put it into practice over the season. But don't forget, as gardeners, at the end of the day, we are at the mercy of what the climate brings us. My second tip is before you get a little bit excited about all of the summer crops like tomatoes and peas, cannot wait for peas again, think about the winter crops you want to grow first. Winter crops, for example, this is purple sprouting broccoli, they require a little bit more time and you need to make sure that you have the space for them to give them enough of an opportunity to develop. So what I like to do is I like to imagine my winter garden and then work backwards and find a common ground where I feel like there's a nice balance and I'm gonna be able to enjoy harvest right through the year. Because a lot of winter crops need to be started around May and because we're so focused on summer, we can easily forget about winter, which is when fresh food is so precious. And the third tip is something that I think has made the biggest difference in terms of the way I garden because it's so easy to get a little bit over eager and create a plan for the whole garden and then suddenly there's there's no spare space, there's no spare gaps because still in April, May and June there's so much planting to be done. What I like to do is make sure I dedicate a little bit of space of the garden to nothing because you never know in April you might suddenly find yourself owning some really interesting seeds that you want to grow or you might have forgotten to grow a particular crop but you don't know where to fit it in because the whole garden is absolutely full so just make sure that there's a bit of breathing space in your plan just to account for any surprises later on down the line and my final thought is this whilst you're thinking so much about all of the plants that you're going to be growing think about other ways that you can make your garden a space that you just want to spend as much time in as possible. Think about it as being a sanctuary for your soul and make it special, make it yours and enjoy the process. You'll find links to resources and to all of my friends' channels in the video description. And now let's head over to Ireland, to Niall from Niall Gardens. When I first saw this garden, I fell for it instantly. And ever since, I've always referred to it as having good bones. Whether it's hedging, trees like these ones, or even just water, for me, these are the bones of the garden. And there's no better time to get out and appreciate the bones of your own garden than now in winter, because so much stuff is revealed. So today, I'm going to show you some of the great structural elements that I have here and why I think you need to appreciate the ones that you have yourself. 
Hedges are a really great way to add structure to your garden. They can be used to create boundaries, define different areas and really separate areas nicely. Plus, they provide a lovely green living element that adds colour and texture to your garden all year round. In my garden, hedges separate the front garden from the driveway, making it that little bit more private and also make our secret garden, well, secret. These beach hedges here were already here and I've used them as what I think is a really lovely divider that tucks this vegetable garden away from everything else in the rest of the back garden. It makes it feel just that little bit enclosed and special. And round here, this little gap gives a tantalizing view both into the veg garden and also back out into the rest of the back garden. And don't forget to look at your own hedges closely and enjoy their finer details because they're not just big blocks of leaves or simple green walls. For instance, this beach has the most beautiful bright lime green leaves in the summer. Then it holds on to its crispy brown leaves all winter. Cypresses, well, they can be lovely and soft and tactile or when they're tightly clipped are like a big solid surface. Cotoneaster leaves turn a lovely red right before they fall off and laurels, well, they stay glossy and green all year round. Trees are another great structural element in the garden here. Just like hedges, they can punctuate a space, they can divide areas up and they just look beautiful. But what I really want to do is show you some of the beautiful details in the trees that I have here in my own garden. The old apple trees in the orchard have the most gnarled branches, which I just love. They're covered in mosses, lichens, ivy, and it gives a really interesting range of little tiny details to look at. In the front garden, our ornamental crab apple is covered in bright golden yellow fruit, which is so punchy in the autumn. The silver birches with their pale white bark just sing out in the winter and when it drops its leaves the corkscrew hazel just looks flat out wacky but best of all is this tree that I'm going to show you now it's a Robinia pseudoacacia rough textured trunks lead to the most contorted branches that I've ever seen it's a real gem there's so much good to say about hedging and trees there's so much choice in terms of color size leaf shape and so on. Plus, they're much cheaper than hard landscaping. Even water can add to the skeleton of the garden. Yes, it's flat, but what it does do is act like punctuation. A calm, flat section of water can make for just a really lovely, different place to sit. And whether it's a container or dug into the ground, you get to pick the size and shape of form that you want in the garden. I think it's really effective, and it does add a really nice alternative structural element. I do want to give one hard landscaping structure an honourable mention, the raised bed. In addition to the practical benefits that raised beds give you, they can also add a really nice visually appealing structure to your garden. The structure creates what I think is a clean cohesive look and it can add a really nice formality. One of the best things of that formality is rhythm. Since most gardens contain a huge variety of plants, shapes, colours, textures, using repeating structures adds a repetition that actually is really calming. It tames that cacophony. And just like the hedges, raised beds don't have to be expensive either. All of my raised beds here in the wind are made from reclaimed scaffolding boards and they look great. Just get out into your garden and look at what you already have and the structures that you can already use and appreciate. And if you want to add more, here is my simple advice. Think about the kind of structures that you really love. Are they buttresses in churches or cathedrals, sweeping rivers, the clouds, you name it. Trust me, the inspiration is there. Then think about incorporating those shapes and the forms that you love into the space that you can have. It can be on whatever scale you choose, big or small, and it also doesn't have to be expensive. And actually, it doesn't even have to be a really big long-term investment. You don't have to put in a big line of hedges or plant huge trees. Start small, pick something like a nice perennial that has lovely winter interest and go from there.
What I'm saying is you have got so many options available to you. Just let your mind go wild and start putting in extra structure into your garden and appreciating what you already have. I'm just checking through the young hedging plants that we put in last year. <laughs> Dear, and some of them are getting drowned uh, by grasses. So I need to uh, clear around them, give them the best chance of growing and without any competition. Uh, I'm also gonna check to see uh, if there are any gaps, so any plants that haven't made it. Uh, this is a hornbeam hedge uh, to go along the edge uh, of the shady garden and in fact it goes uh, all the way down the side of the food forest as well. And these hedging plants were very very quick to put in. Uh, I bought them as whips so that's a, just basically it's a stem with a root on it uh, and you can plant them quickly and easily. First of all make a cross with your spade so in one direction in at an opposite angle and a third cut to the side and as you lift up it will open up the center and all you need to do uh, is take your young plants check the roots are nice and healthy push the plant sort of into that central space and then uh, lever the spade back up, pull it out and firm it in. And when you get going uh, with a rhythm of these, it takes about 30 seconds or so uh, per tree. Don't forget to uh, clean your spade after use to keep it in really nice condition. And I get uh, most of my hedging plants uh, from direct plants. I will leave a link uh, in the video description uh, so that you can find them. There, well, <laughs> it's better than it was. <laughs> I will now go and store this away again. If you want to know a bit more about how I grow and harvest, prepare and store uh, all the vegetables that I grow in the garden, I've written a book. It's called The Seasoned Gardener and it's now available to pre-order. It will be published in the spring um, in the UK and late spring uh, in USA. Uh, and you can find it uh, on Amazon, on other online stores. But if you want a signed copy and if you want to support me uh, the most, you can order it from my website at buythefarm.com forward slash books. Well, I found a bit of winter sunshine uh, here in the garden of Sue Kent down on the south coast of Wales. It's beautiful here, so uh, she's been showing me around her garden a bit and we're going to chat about some of the things that you do in your garden in January. Well, in January, I tend to like to rest on my laurels a little bit and enjoy the cold weather from inside. But on a lovely day like this, I tend to come out and check what I've got growing and because I make my own compost often I get weeds growing and to get them out of the pots before they develop is a little job that I like doing at this time of year. Oh, can I do that couple? You can pull out your weeds and I, I... And if you get them when the soil's nice and moist and you pull gently you normally get the whole root so you prevent a problem developing you know over the season mm. if you left them in there. And the other thing I like to do is you know because I garden with my feet I, I can't really walk around um, in bare feet in the winter, it's too cold. And with my hands, if I put a big coat on, I can't do anything. So I'm very restricted by the weather. So I like to plan. I don't know about you, Liz. Yes, planning. And actually, the, my best gardens happen in my head. They're, they're way nicer and they're way more full and they're much <laughs> more the re reality. <laughs> the reality. Yes, I do get insomnia. And I find that YouTube and Instagram very good at four o'clock in the morning. And especially I like Instagram because if you type in the name of a plant, um, you see it in reality in people's gardens. Whereas mm. if you look at it in the catalogues, you often can't get the scale of it. And you can't imagine it next to something else. Or you get them hideously coloured and you yes. suddenly find yes. there's like these <laughs> rainbow <laughs> things. And you find the reality, so, you know, they're so different in reality. And I, I find that, you know, people's social media posts 
on pl plants, you know, hashtag a certain plant name, very informative. Yeah. So that's what I tend to do in January, but I do sort through my seeds and I, and I am reading the catalogues to see if I can find a variety that might suit me more of certain things. Uh, but here in front of me, um, I've got lots of, of like, I've got foxgloves that I'm growing for another these border. Are, these yeah. are looking really good. And I've got bulbs that I'm growing in, in, in tubs so that I can put them exactly where I want them. Um, that's a good idea. That's a good yeah. idea. And I, le I learned this from doing uh, a show garden at Hampton Court and that I grew a lot of allium, you know, the, uh, the drumstick alliums. Yeah. And they came, became invaluable in the Hampton Court. And I was, I was terrified they weren't going to be ready. But by having lots of different pots, I put them in the shady areas, I put them in the sunny areas, and we managed to, to get them perfect. So yeah. that was last year, wasn't it? That, that was, was last, last year, year. Uh, at uh, RHS. And I won a silver gilt for my first attempt with no experience. And so the people's choice. That's it's, fantastic. So, yeah. So what are you doing with the rest of your year? Are you out and about doing stuff oh and actually can people come and listen to you yes you? actually i've been doing some talks and i've got one um at the blake theater in monmouth i don't know if you know that and i'm i'm there in february and i'm talking about the hampton court garden and you know making a show garden with no experience was quite quite an event and no money and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sharing with people the ups and downs of making a show garden, but also for a, you know, your, your general gardener, you don't want to be a garden designer, but you want to pimp your garden a bit. There's a lot that I found out that, you know, that you can, you can oh, do using show garden principles. And also, you know, I'm very much environmentally aware. And so it's how you can create a show garden you know, with a minimal impact yeah. and super wildlife friendly. You often see a lot of wildlife friendly gardens that are wild, whereas I had quite a formal structure garden. But I, you know, how I created that and how I selected the plants, you know, and did it is what I'll be sharing. There. So people Brilliant. can really increase the wildlife into their garden, but maintaining that sort of formal, you know, garden border. Yes. Brilliant. So I will leave a link uh, in the video description uh, if you want to join Sue uh, in Monmouth. It will be it will be lovely to come along and, and hear me chat and meet everybody. And next we're heading to Kent where Alexandra will share some of the January beauty from her middle-sized garden. We're in South East England which theoretically equates to a USDA gardening zone of nine but of course our summers with the exception of last summer are nowhere near as hot maybe 23 Celsius would be about average and our winters are very mild and it's rare for us to have snow or frost or to go below minus six Celsius 21 Fahrenheit. So when you step outside the back door, you go up some steps to the nearest part of the garden to the house, which we call the parterre. The elements here that work really well in a January garden are the evergreens, which is the lavender. And I think often people don't think about lavender as being an evergreen. And also the grasses in pots. I don't have many grasses in the rest of the garden, but I do think grasses work really well in pots because they're very easy care. Statuary and garden ornaments also make a big difference in the January garden and we've got this sundial which was given to us by some friends for a birthday. There's also evergreen plants in pots, they're pines and formium and the lavender has a blue foliage, the pines have a dark green and the formium has stripes so you've got that contrast there. So then if we go into the back garden the main things here are the topiary trees I always wanted topiary, but it is expensive. So we bought two home oaks for £50 each, and they were young whips. They were just young, straight trees. And it was about three years before we could cut them into any sort of shape. And it was about seven years before they actually turned into the shape that you see now. Next to them is a holly golden king, and that was a big shrub in the garden here when we came. And Charlotte Molesworth, who got a very famous topiary garden in Kent, said to me, oh, you should topiarise that. You should just look at what the shape is and sort of cut it within its own shape. I have to say, I don't think I'm skilled enough to do my own topiary. So I've always got professional gardeners to do it. But once again, it took about three years. It was cut into shape and it was sort of just loosely a shape. And then the next year it was a bit sharper. And then since then, we've been able to cut it into that sharp shape you can see there now. And then on either side of the bench 
are two privet lollipops and those are much cheaper to get but actually they're much more work because you do have to cut them about three or four times a year as privet is very fast growing. And one important element in my enjoying this garden is that we have a shelter at the other end of the garden. It's a pergola which was actually here when we moved into the house and my brother-in-law gave it a corrugated iron roof. So I can come out here in all weathers and I usually bring a cup of tea out here first thing in the morning or when I want a break from work and I can just sit here and I can listen to the bird song and really enjoy those browns and greens and greys and bark textures of winter and it's a different view of the garden. And you don't need to have a covered shelter if you can't fit one in, even just a bench that you could go to on sunny days and just sit there and enjoy being in the garden in the winter. I love Alexandra's garden, there's always so much to enjoy in it and we'll be heading back there very soon. Uh, but now Jane Kelly is going to walk around her garden and create an absolutely beautiful display to take into her house. Okay, let's go and see if we can fill this truck. let's just see what we've got. I think what we lack in colour at this time of year we certainly make up for in texture so for example if I show you what I've got it's quite exciting this I mean obviously there's berries everywhere and what I'm trying to do <laughs> is steer away from the red and green of Christmas but I think come on you can't resist those can you? Look at those beautiful bright berries. I've only picked a couple because obviously I don't want to deprive the birds. But yes, I wasn't going to use red at all, but I just couldn't resist those. What else have I got? I have got ivy. <laughs> a little bit Christmas themed, I suppose, but some of it is this beautiful variegated ivy. So I'll put that there. And the other has got, as you'll have seen, these gorgeous berries. Now again, the pigeons in particular adore these berries, so I don't want to take too much of their food. But really, aren't they just beautiful? So yeah, so there's my ivy. And then I started to think about the evergreens that we have. We actually have a gorgeous spotted laurel tree, which needed a bit of a prune. So there we have our splash of yellow, which takes us towards more of a January and spring colour palette. I'm not doing colour palettes, I'm just doing what I found in the garden. Oh, catkins. How gorgeous are they? Beautiful things. So yeah, tinge of yellow, beautiful pinky colour when they first start, but they've got to go in, haven't they? They're a sign of this time of year. So let's get started. Okay, so what I'm going to do, which is a little bit strange for me, I was going to use a much smaller vase, but actually this big weighty jug is perfect because quite a weight to it and I think this is probably going to be quite top heavy. So all I'm going to do, back to front, wish me luck, is start off with a couple of the tallest pieces. So in my case, this is the ivy. Strip the lower leaves. Now it's been freshly cut so I don't have to recut the bottom. I'll take that little one off and I'll show you why in a moment. And that little one, oh, they're going to be under the water. I'll put those over there and we'll just pop that in, see where it lands. Okay, that wants to go over there. Right, next biggish one I've got is the beautiful, beautiful Spotted Bay. <clears throat> now this just injects that colour of spring. We all know those first flowers that we are going to see are going to be the yellow daffodils, the beautiful tete-a-tete, the narcissi. Let's pop that in there. 
with the snowdrops and that gorgeous, gorgeous purpley blue that we get with the with the crocus that start to come up. Okay, let's see what we can do now. Take another big one. I'm going to take this one now. Now this again. The reason we take the leaves and the growth off the bottom, I mean that's a shame isn't it because they're birds berries but they've got plenty out there, is so that they don't go mouldy. So all I'm going to do is just clip these, clip these. So I've got as much as I can, I've got a nice clean stem going in the water. Then we've got this beautiful, um, I'll use that in a minute, we've got this beautiful variegated ivy. So this lends its shape perfectly to coming down the front of the vase. And we just carry on and we carry on until we can't carry on anymore. And I think, looking at that, considering there are no flowers in the garden at all at the moment, that is giving us the most beautiful display of spring. Isn't it lovely to be able to have some colour uh, from your garden to take into your house even when there aren't any flowers. So today I am starting to cut back my autumn fruiting raspberries and the reason for doing this is it will stimulate growth in the spring to come up from uh, underground. Autumn fruiting raspberries uh, produce fruit on new growth, on the, the growth it has put out this year. Whereas summer fruiting raspberries produce flowers and fruit on last year's growth. So I really like autumn fruiting raspberries because I don't have to think about how I prune them. I don't need to tie them in. Uh, they're very easy, you just take them uh, down to I'm saying ground level, but it's not. I'm leaving three to four inches, so eight to 10 centimetres above ground. And at any point during the dormant period, you can do this. So any time from late November uh, through to early March. Um, I would say late March, but in many places, it's already starting into growth by then. And you've got a couple of options. You can take them off uh, right down at ground level, or you could take them uh, down to about 30 to 40 centimetres high. If you do this, you're going to end up with taller plants, which if you're on a very windy site like this, uh, they'll just end up flopping over. Um, but what you will do is you're likely to get fruits slightly earlier in the year. And you can actually just leave them and not cut them back at all. And the new growth uh, will come out along the whole length, but then you're going to get very top heavy plants that are very likely to do uh, exactly what this one has done, uh, which is flop over with the weight of it. So there we go. So I put in this raspberry hedge in, I think it was March this year. So it's still uh, quite a young hedge. Uh, there are two varieties in here. I've got uh, Autumn Bliss at that end and one called, and luckily I still have a label on it, uh, but it's faded in the wind. I think it's called Ziva, uh, Z-E-V-A. Um, so uh, two different varieties. They do actually taste slightly different um, and I'm not sure as yet which I prefer. But anyway, hopefully we will have masses uh, of raspberries this year. If you live in an incredibly cold area, uh, you can do this um, in November and then uh, give them a good mulch. Uh, if you live in a very wet area, it might be worth uh, planting the plants on a raised, uh, a raised mound uh, like we've got here. But wherever you plant them, uh, just be aware that raspberries are incredibly vigorous plants. They'll send out new shoots and new runners year after year. So your nice, neatly contained raspberry bread uh, will spread 
at a, <laughs> quite a distance and form quite a thicket. In my mother-in-law's garden, she had a raspberry bed uh, in her lawn. So the lawnmower cut the top off any stray shoots all the time and just confined those raspberries uh, to that one bed, which I thought was a really neat idea. The stems that you've cut off your raspberries uh, can be shredded and added to your compost pile. Uh, they can just be broken up or chopped up and put in the pile. Uh, or you can use them uh, to make a really neat little fence, like a, almost like a hurdle. So you push some canes into the ground and then you weave uh, other pieces uh, between them. Uh, Tanya over at Lovely Greens has done this a few times. I've been really impressed with it. I think January should mostly be used for uh, rest and recuperation and maybe a bit of garden planning. But if, like me, uh, you feel the need to be out in the fresh air and to be doing something, there are a few activities you can do as long as you're not standing on very frozen soil or very waterlogged soil so that you don't damage the soil structure. And inside, uh, there are a few things you can do, like planting some seeds. And here's JB from Naturally JB to talk about one of those. For me, they, there is just nothing as beautiful or exciting that you can grow as chilli peppers. And the new year is a really good time to start thinking about sowing them. Now, the first thing to think about is your seed source when it comes to chilli peppers. Chilli peppers cross-pollinate really, really easily. And you wanna make sure that you're getting seeds from a quality supplier, preferably a chilli specialist, because they are most likely to have seeds that are gonna be properly isolated. There is nothing worse than spending six months nurturing a beautiful chilli plant, only for it to put out these mysterious pods that don't look like anything that you were expecting. And it's really, really disappointing. Probably the most important thing to know about chilli peppers is that they, they have a really long growing season. A lot of people kind of group tomatoes and chili peppers together. I don't think that's particularly helpful because I find tomatoes grow much, much faster than a chili pepper. So generally speaking with chili peppers, the earlier you can get started on your season, the better. But this time of year, kind of the start of the year, January, February, it can be very challenging. There are two main limiting factors to think about if you're growing indoors. The first is light. If you don't have access to a grow light and you've only got kind of a south facing windowsill, even in February, that light is going to be really low and there's not going to be that many hours of sun on the plant. And the second is space. If you plant too early, by April, your seedlings are going to be getting really, really big. You're likely, if you're like me anyway, you're going to be running out of space in your house and you're going to want to get them out. But if there's frost outside, you can really risk hammering your plants. So the next thing to think about is what variety of chili pepper you're growing. So varieties, did you know there are literally thousands of different chili pepper varieties, but they are all governed by five main kind of subspecies. You have Anum, Chinens, Pubescens, Bacatum, and Frutescens, and they all have their own slight distinct characteristics, but one to really focus on is Chinens. Now, Chinens are the kind of super hot plants. They're things like the Seven Pot Primo or the Carolina Reaper, the habanero, the scotch bonnet, the ghost or the butcher loki, all these kind of really exciting, blow your head off <laughs> spices. My tongue is on fire. I can't even think. My face is going numb. I can't feel my arms. They're characterized by these kind of nice broad, spreading leaves and the distinctive pods, you know, things with stingers or tails, all that kind of stuff. They're really wrinkly <laughs> as well. And those Chinens varieties are much, much slower growing. So what I'm gonna be doing today in my little heated propagator is getting my Chinens varieties going at the start of January and then come mid kind of February, that's when I'm gonna be starting my Anums and my other much faster growing varieties. So you've got your reliably sourced seed, you know roughly when you wanna be getting it germinated. The question is, what do chili seeds need? There's one thing in particular that sets them apart and that is warmth. You wanna be aiming for around 27 degrees Celsius. So I'm growing in soil and I've got a soil probe set to 27 degrees C. That's kind of optimum. You can use a heated propagator, a heat mat, or, or if you don't have those, you can use a wet paper towel in a Ziploc bag on the radiator. It's not ideal, but whatever you need to do to get those seeds warm so that they germinate. 
And then in terms of your soil medium, you just want something that's going to hold the moisture and be warm. They don't need any nutrients in here. I tend to use spent compost and that works fine. It's just not something nice and fine for them to get their feet into. And then as soon as they do start coming up, which can take a while, that's another thing to note with chili peppers. They can take up to three or four weeks to germinate. So you do have to have a little bit of patience, but once they start coming up, time to get your lids off, get good airflow on them. That can be a problem indoors. Get good airflow, get your lights on, or get them on the windowsill. And that is it. That is how to start chili seeds. Even if you're not particularly into spicy foods, I do really recommend that you give chili plants a go. There are so many interesting and wonderful varieties out there, and they might just capture your imagination like they did mine. And we'll return to JB a bit later in the year to see how his chilies and his pepper plants are growing. Now there are some other seeds that you can start planting at this time of year. And if you'd like to find out a bit more about those, I'll leave a link on the screen. And if you click on that, it'll take you directly through to that video.